The great thing about following Dr. Cassie, yeah, there's just no way I could. This is like when I played high school football, American football, and all these big corn-fed Kansans, and if I tackled one person, it was a hit. So if I get one person to laugh, maybe, maybe we're okay. Um, and also, I made many, many mistakes in this talk, which I am more than happy to tell you about uh, as, we, as we go forward. Uh, before I get started, I just want to thank everybody so much, uh, the, the organizer.md for inviting me, uh, for introducing me to this, this marvelous uh, country, which I was last in in 1989 with an old girlfriend who I promise you I'm over um, <laughs> with. And I, um, I recognize that there are zero interactions. Maybe it's Galway, maybe it's Ireland, I'm not sure that don't get prolonged by story after story after story. Um, you guys drive on a different side of the road than we do. Um, I rented a car and discovered that by, at a very slow speed, taking the rear view mirror off of a car to my left <laughs> in a town where there was a matchmaking festival going on, Listoverna. The gentleman, it, where I, I live in Boston now, this would be like, fights. This would be a dangerous moment. He invited me into his trailer. I thought he's going to murder me. He wasn't going to... He was, he was lovely. He said, don't worry about that. When you get back, report it to the police. So we had a nice chat. I go, my daughter was with me too. We go back. I go to the Mill Street Garden Station. I think this is going to be awful. We talked for an hour and 20 minutes about the merits of Gaelic football versus soccer versus American football. So I'm not leaving. My wife thinks I've joined a cult and maybe <laughs> I have. Um, we're going to talk about zombies, though. Sorry, I've just eaten into a lot of my time. Um, I did make a mistake with that title. That's my first mistake. I'm in Ireland. I have to change the title. So it's not a bar. It's a pub. A <laughs> physician, a zombie, and a patient walk into a pub. Um, I am a psychiatrist, so I do have disclosures. We all have disclosures. My university requires me to tell you that I don't have any disclosures to industry. In other words, I've never received money from the pharmaceutical companies. But as I said, I'm a shrink. I got lots of disclosures. I would like to tell you, first of all, that I'm delighted to be here. I will disclose that. I would like to disclose that I am nervous as hell right now, and I'll get to more of that in a little bit. I would also like to disclose that, unfortunately, I'm going to tell a joke, and I would very much like it if someone laughs. And even, even the tiniest little chortle from the audience would be um, enough to send me home skipping. Here's the main reasons I'm nervous. The first reason actually wasn't there until that first night when we had dinner, and I realized, oh my goodness, usually I'm the guy who comes to the convention and talks, gives the quirky zombie talk, and it's the unique, weird, wonderful thing, and it doesn't get compared to everybody. You guys have all beat me to the punch. You guys have all given neat, cool, quirky talks. I think what I have to do is just give something boring so I'll stand out in <laughs> some kind of way. Um, the, second, the second reason is the title of my talk, as I said it suggests that I must now formally tell a joke. And so before I formally attempt to tell you a joke, which I attempted to write before coming here, I'd like to issue a couple of caveats, okay? The first one is you should never, ever call your presentation the first thing that <laughs> pops into your mind when you get your email from the organizers and say, what would you like to call your talk? You should sleep on it, okay? <laughs> In fact, you should discuss it with your family, with your friends. You should talk to your dog about it, which I I did. That's my youngest daughter, Naomi, and our dog, Blueberry. They all rolled their eyes at me, even the dog. They said, don't do this. But I'd already sent it off. So I sat down and I wrote a joke. A doctor, a patient, and a zombie walk into a pub. As far as I know, there is only one zombie film that takes place largely in a pub. It's Shaun of the Dead, which is one of the very best zombie movies ever made. If you go home and you haven't ever seen a zombie film, it's a good one to start with. Here is the joke. A doctor, a patient, and a zombie all walk into a bar. It's a busy Friday night, but as luck would have it, there's three bar stools next to each other, so they all take their seats, and the bartender, he has questions. He doesn't quite understand how many glasses he ought to polish, so he waits for someone to speak, and the doctor, as doctors are wont to do after busy days, he speaks first, and he says, I, with a flourish, I'm a doctor, and I've had a very busy day, and my wife is expecting me home right now, but I thought I would just jump in here for a quick one before I go home to prepare myself for the rest of the night. And the bartender's heard this story before, so he nods and he gives him a pint of Guinness, and the, the physician takes a drink and wipes the froth off the top of his lip, puts it down, thanks him, and then the bartender turns his attention to the patient. Now you might wonder, how do we know that this is a patient? 
Well, he's wearing one of those hospital gowns they give you, and he stands up with a flourish, he spins around, and as he spins, his bare bum is visible to the entire bar, at which point the bartender asks him to please sit down and get on the stool, which he does, and the patient then says, I'm a patient, and I was scheduled for my cystoscopy today but I made the mistake of bringing my mobile into the waiting room and I googled images of the procedure and I promptly fainted. <laughs> the physician says it's true I had to bring him here or else he would have made my already long day even longer. This makes sense to the bartender. He gives him his pint of Guinness. The patient takes a drink, wipes the froth off the top of his mouth, sets it down. And then the doctor and the patient seem to ignore the third member of their party. Now, this is the zombie. The bartender waits for the zombie to speak. The zombie, because zombies are zombies, can't really speak. He kind of sways one direction, and they all sway one direction. Then he sways the other, and they all sway the other, like they're waves of grain in a field. And then, with a noise, his ear falls off, pops down onto the bar, and quick as a snake, the bartender takes the towel off of his shoulder, wipes off the ear, wipes off the blood, throws it into the trash, gets a fresh towel, puts it on top, and says, what can I give you to the zombie? And after a bit, the doctor says, oh, don't bother with him. I haven't the foggiest idea what to do with him. One of the kids told me that he's called a zombie, but there's nowhere in the electronic medical record to check off zombie. I have no idea how to make him better. He just follows me around. And as long as I walk slightly faster, he doesn't catch me. And the patient says, it's true, he followed me in here. And the bartender thinks about this and then reaches under the bar instead and brings out a tumbler. And he reaches to the top shelf and gets his bottle of the finest whiskey. And he gives him not one, not two, but three fingerfuls of his finest whiskey. The zombie, of course, doesn't know what to make of this, just stares down at the whiskey. But the doctor and the patient are incensed. They say, what's going on? Why does he get the good stuff? All we got was beer. And the bartender says, well, this gentleman motioning to the zombie. He could be a patient, he could be a doctor, he could be you, he could be me, but you've decided that he's none of these things, that he is simply a monster, that he's the other. I sure wouldn't want to end up like him, so the least I can do is give him this whiskey. And the doctor smiles and shakes his head. He says, don't worry, my understanding is these zombie things, they never spread. <laughs> That's the joke. <laughs> it's not bad, I wrote it. It has within it a parable, though, right? Because ideally speaking, any of these people could exchange places. But something bizarre happens in zombie stories. When I ask medical students, what would you do if you encountered me in this moment? And those were real zombies, not fake zombies at the Toronto Film Festival. They were real zombies. By the way, this was the largest ever zombie walk in the history of Toronto, which I don't think was a hard record to break, because I'm not sure there'd been that many zombie walks at that point. <laughs> The medical students have one quick pattern recognition driven response. They get rid of that bottom arrow where patient equals zombie. They decided that a patient is a patient is a zombie is a zombie. If I had said, what would you do for this patient, they would answer differently. But I say, what would you do just for this, for this picture? I don't even say zombie. And they say, shoot him. We should shoot him in the head. We should knock him in the head with the cricket bat as Sean does. We should throw rocks at their head, beat them, destroy them, kill them, get, get, get them away from us. And I say, no, 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 you're medical students. You're not supposed to do that. You're supposed to make them better. That is what leads me to my agenda, which I probably should have shown you before slide 10, as I was taught. But I'm going to tell you a story, because we're in Galway after a while about how I got interested in zombies. I'm gonna tell you how we use zombies as a substrate to teach functional neuroscience and why I would jeopardize my career, and I actually almost did, and I'll tell you a little bit about how the rather stodgy institution at which I teach was not thrilled that I was using zombies in the classroom. <laughs> what zombies can teach us about empathy, how zombies help us to ask some really tough questions, questions that are very hard to ask if we ask them directly. How do we differentiate mind and brain? How do we know when somebody is really dead? How do we define death in the first place? That's my death panel segue, since I know that we're, this, that's the topic here. How do, we, how do we know when we've decided something or someone is so different from us that we have permission to treat them differently? It happens all the time in hospitals. But it's a very hard thing to discuss, but if you move it into the displacement of the zombie question, it's much easier to discuss, because your tongue is deeply in your cheek, so we can have fun with it. And that will end then, paradoxically, with a discussion of the powers of connection and the inspiration that I draw from zombies, which, let's be honest, are not very connected and not terribly inspiring. Nevertheless, they have actually changed my career.
So how did I get interested? Uh, that's my family. Um, that's my wife, Ruta. Uh, my older daughter, Sophia, actually came to the start of this meeting. She's now in Edinburgh with her wildest friend, but her job is to keep her friend under control, so hopefully things are going well. That's my daughter, Naomi. And then the little tiny creature my daughter, Naomi, is holding is our um, little tiny dog. Uh, I adore that dog. He's a mixture of a Yorkie and a Datsun. That makes him a dorky. Um, and he is a sociopath, that dog. So if you ever come to visit me, I will welcome you with open arms and also advise you to stay away from my dorky because um, he'll bite your finger off. My wife, uh, 10 years ago, got breast cancer. It, it's an easier story for me to tell now because she is fine. It was about the bed prog best prognosis breast cancer you can have and still have it be breast cancer, and it scared me. My kids were little. Um, my wife was sick. So my routine was to get everybody into their respective beds and then go down and watch what was on TV. I would tuck in my wife after her chemotherapy session. I would tuck in my older daughter, my younger daughter. Oh, but my wife is also a physician. She's also a psychiatrist. I met her in residency. And uh, um, because we're both psychiatrists, perhaps, when we went to my oldest daughter and said, hey, sweetie, this is going to be hard, sometimes when these things happen, it's useful if you go talk to, and I didn't even finish the sentence. My older daughter said, I don't want to see a therapist. That was her opening thing, so she knew what we were, where we were going with that. Um, so I got everybody to sleep, and I would go downstairs and watch what was on TV, and Night of the Living Dead was on TV, and if you know your horror history, you'll know that it's always on TV because it's an eminent domain movie. Uh, George Romero, who I later became very close with, and we'll talk more about that later, didn't know he would be a filmmaker and didn't copyright the film. He was, at the time, a cameraman for Mr. Rogers, which was a much-beloved American show for little kids, um, and he thought, on the side, I'll make this film, which was really going to be a metaphor for the Vietnam War. So I thought, I can't make my wife better. That's up to the oncologist, and they did a good job, thank God. But maybe I can make these zombies better because they're not real. So I sat down at the computer with a, with a beer and some Doritos, and I wrote a fake medical paper in the sort of New England Journal style, and I put it online, and it went viral. And then I was eventually contacted by a publisher who said, would you be willing to turn this into a novel? And I said, sure. And because I'm in academia, I said, sure, for free. I didn't understand that you get actually a book contract. So then somebody got in touch with me and said, you know what, this is like Little Brown. They're a for-profit company. You're allowed to negotiate with them. So I went back and got a book contract. That was the first novel I wrote. In it, I invented a disease, because it was my book. I get to call it whatever I want. I invented ANSD, or ataxic, neurodegenerative, can't even open windows or doors, satiety deficiency, don't know when you haven't eaten enough, and I called it a syndrome, which is the term we use when a bunch of symptoms coalesce together more often than not. Why would I do this? Why would I use zombies to teach in the classroom? And at the time, remember in that very first lecture we had, and it was psychiatrists versus everyone on that, on that first slide? I was the director of medical student education and psychiatry for Harvard Medical School. And I had this sense that was later borne out by data that I collected that they really didn't take psychiatry seriously. And I was, I was hell-bent on being taken seriously. But I worried, because of the typical medical student, that's uh, Kumar from Harold and Kumar, go to White Castle, that's the moment where he's being interviewed by the dean of admissions for the med school, but then takes a cell phone call to make sure he has enough beer for the night um, and doesn't, doesn't get in. The typical medical student thinks to themselves, oh, it's the psychiatry lecture. It's likely to be a diminutive, bald, probably Jewish man who's going to come in and give us a lecture, and it's the fluff. It's the fluff. That's literally what the dean of education called psychiatry when I was there. He said, you guys teach the fluff. And so what did we do at Harvard? We gave them two diminutive, short, <laughs> bald Jewish guys. Um, so that's uh, Jonathan Alpert and myself. We were the co-directors of medical student education. John is now the chief of psychiatry at um, Einstein Medical School in the Bronx. Um, so I thought, I gotta, I gotta grab their attention somehow. So I could show them this, right? Because after all, that's the organ of interest for psychiatry. I could show them this transection of the brain, but they're gonna yawn because they're gonna think in his zeal to be taken seriously as a physician, he's gonna go straight to the organs and the anatomy, or I could show them that. 
And that's going to make people pay attention. That's actually a drawing from the book that I wrote. Uh, when, we, when I created this novel, the publisher had this great idea, which I could claim it, but it wasn't, that we had to illustrate it too. So if you, if you get a chance to look at it out there, it's got these really lovely gothic drawings uh, that are, I sort of would describe, and then the, the uh, artist, who is a children's book author, went to the NYU uh, anatomy lab and actually would then send me examples of what I thought it should look like. It's the exact same transection as you can see with the possible exception other than that laser's work, it's not. I'll just kind of point to it. That big structure there in the middle, that's the amygdala, because they're always so angry, so I wanted the amygdala to be hypertrophied. Zombies are, are blunt creatures. There are risks, though, to giving this lecture. That's the cover of the New York Times on October 31st, 1938, when Orson Welles did his very famous reenactment of the H.G. Wells' War of the Worlds. And if you guys know the story, he, um, he didn't, they didn't say on the radio, we're going to tell you a story. They just had the symphony play, and then they said, we interrupt this program to say there's been some gas explosions on Mars, more on that later. And then they kept telling more and more of the story, and there was sporadic but widespread panic. I actually wrote a piece about this for the New York Times Magazine. I somehow created the same panic, not on purpose. I went on a radio show that's on in the United States from 2 a.m. to 6 a.m. called Coast to Coast. And it's, their shtick is to talk to authors as if what they did was real. And it's kind of fun. You get to improv with them. So when I would talk to Ian Punnett, he was the um, host on Coast to Coast, he would say, how did you get this manuscript? And I would say, it was sent to me from a robo-server in Southeast Asia, and someone's watching now, I need to shut the window. I literally said that, and, they, and we were sort of going back and forth, but every 15 or 20 minutes, we would break for a commercial, like for lawn fertilizer or something. Didn't really seem like you would do that, it were the end of the world. And yet, we started getting emails like this one. Um, people got really mad. If a Harvard physician was willing to talk about zombies on the radio, then this must be real. This must be a real phenomena. And this is where Harvard actually got upset with me. The dean of the medical school brought me in, and he said, you must stop writing these novels. And I said, I, I don't want to stop writing these novels. And he said, well, you have to. I'm telling you to. And I said, well, fine, I quit. And he said, no, no, that's not what I want. And I said, no, I understand the terms. I just, I, I want to write these novels. They're fun to write. And he said, well, why can't you write like a Atul Gawande? And I said, because I'm not as talented as a Atul Gawande. <laughs> but where I would write like a Atul Gawande. And then he said, and th I'm not making any of this up, um, and he's given me permission to share the story. This is the Dean of Education. He said, well, you have to make some kind of announcement that zombies aren't real. And uh, <laughs> really, um, so it's like, you, you want me to like call CNN and say like, <laughs> Harvard denies the existence of zombies? Um, so I didn't do that. Um, but there are risks, so I'm telling you now, they are not now, nor will they ever be real. I'm actually required to tell you that. Um, when I talk about zombies to medical students, though, I say, let's, let's just figure out what's wrong with them. Let's not think of them as zombies. Let's think of them as people with some kind of disease, like ANSD. And this gives me the opportunity to talk about the things that they can't do and then to try and draw it to correlates to what's going on in their brain. I'll often mention Phineas Gage, which I'm sure all of you know the story. He had this horrible day on September 13, 1848, where the crowbar blasted up, went through his cheek, pierced his frontal lobe, and he lost the ability for his frontal lobe to communicate with the more primitive regions of the brain. He had been the foreman for a railroad in Cavendish, Vermont at the time. The foreman's job, actually, is to maintain order, but he couldn't stay out of a fight after that. Fascinatingly, he didn't even lose consciousness when this happened. The story is that he wandered around after the thing went in him, and people said, you need to go see the doctor. And he said, why? And they said, just go see the doctor. <laughs> and he went... They took the thing out. He lived for another 15 or 20 years working with horses in Lebanon, New Hampshire, but was never the same man again. I also put this up here as an example of hubris because Harvard has his skull in the Countway Library, which is pretty cool to see, but then they claim that this was the first example that head trauma leads to changes in behavior, which of course it's not. Ever since humans have been humans, they've hit each other in the head and it has changed their behaviors. But I'll mention Phineas Gage because I'll say zombies couldn't do the same executive functions that Phineas Gage slowly lost his ability to do. They get to a window and they can't open it. They can't solve complex problems. They lose the ability for their frontal lobe to talk to the more primitive regions of the brain, to the amygdala, to the fight-or-flight region. And in fact, from an evolutionary perspective, I'll tell the med students, 
This is about all you got from a crocodile's brain right there. So if that's all you have, you're either going to run or you're going to fight. And crocodiles turn out to be not bad animal substrates for zombies. And the reason I say that is, among all of the monsters that have been created for, for cinema and for stories, zombies are the one that care the least about you. Um, vampires, they might care about you, they might not, but you at least feel wanted and loved and lusted after. <laughs> The zombie, if I step to the right, I'll eat that guy's guts, right? It's not about my guts. And that's actually what's most maddening about zombie films. We'll get to that in a little bit, too, in a, in a couple slides. Uh, if someone's going to eviscerate you, you'd like it to be about you, right? You don't want it to be just <laughs> random guts. So crocodiles are like that. You can't get mad at a crocodile the same way you can't get mad at a zombie. Uh, the frontal lobe relies on the amygdala. This allows me to sort of make a pitch to the students to not become Vulcans in the classroom, that you can't be all frontal lobe. You've got to let your amygdala in on the picture, and you can't be all amygdala as you get in fights all the time. We know it's this balance between higher and lower brain that makes us human, so I get to do this little diversion towards poetry, and I'll usually read a poem or two as a former English teacher. It's easy for me to do. And then I'll point out that sometimes these things can get out of balance. And then I apologize for this ancient pop culture reference, but it's still one of my favorites. Anybody know what show that is? Buffy. It's Buffy, yes. And actually, I love the website. It's spikespotting.com. Um, that's when Buffy, who's the one vampire slayer chosen by the cosmos to kill vampires, happens to be making out with a vampire. So in this case, both of them are thinking with their amygdalae, not with their frontal lobes. Things can get out of, out of sorts. The zombie, therefore, has brain dysfunction that leads to cognitive deficits, that's the neurodegenerative part, has a worsening ability to ambulate, has truncal ataxia, so there you have to implicate the cerebellum and the basal ganglia, has ravenous hunger. There you would have to talk about the ventral medial hypothalamus, which you can actually induce lesions there, or there are some diseases, the virus, some adenoviruses, that are particular to the people who get them, so now I get to sort of draw on in infectious diseases. They are filled with rage. They would run because they're all amygdala. They don't have any, much of a frontal lobe anymore, but they're filled with rage because they're hungry. So they're chasing their prey. So you start to sort of make sense of what ails them, and then you have to get it to pandemic pr proportions. This is actually where George and I would disagree. He said, well, they can do it through biting. I'm like, no, you can't get, like, can you imagine a pandemic of rabies? You're not going to have that. You just need to put a fence around a zombie, and you're done. All you have to do is walk slightly faster in the other direction to stay out of their way. So you need an airborne infection. And in the book I wrote, I sort of go into more detail on that. In other words, what is the zombie? The zombie's a patient. That's the point I tried to make, a patient like that one. That's me at my sleep study when my wife finally sent me with a recording of my snoring to my sleep doctor and said, you must get this checked out. And it turned out that I had horrific sleep apnea and I sleep so much better, but as a total aside and digression, I can tell you, you put that CPAP on, the night is over. Like, it is the least sexy thing I ever do. <laughs> um, you can't, as my wife said, you can't unsee that. It's, it's, it's done. So you put it on, you go to sleep, everything's fine. Um, but it's a patient, okay? So how do we understand that we respond differently to the patient, where my wife feels a little sad for me, the sleep doctor's treated me well, and this is a little nod to the excellent sleep talk that we had yesterday, to what Sean wants to do here in Shaun of the Dead, where he sees what are clearly sick people, and rather than trying to help them, and it's not that hard to actually corner them off and not get bit, he tries to beat them to death with a cricket bat. How do we understand that? And that allows me then to talk about the really cool stuff in, in um, neuroscience, and especially uh, uh, neuropsychiatry, this, this idea of mirror neurons, which I'm sure all of you are familiar with. But just to briefly uh, review it, mirror neurons, it's a theoretical construct at this point, although there's evidence in functional MRI, that if I were to watch somebody else, say, have a cup of coffee, and I was really wanting that cup of coffee, I would marshal the regions of my brain that are not only involved in the motor operations of picking up that coffee, but I would taste the coffee. The somatosensory area would trigger such that the sensory regions of the brain would taste the coffee, which is by definition psychotic, right? Because I'm experiencing a stimulus that I'm not experiencing. The frontal lobe sits on that, but we know that we connect with each other. In fact, a lot of people think this is one of the neurobiological models for empathy. Now, this doesn't just happen with coffee. This happens in fighting, too. If you've ever watched boxing, which I know is medically indefensible, but I still really, really love watching the sport, you'll notice that when they throw a punch, they're not just looking at how the punch worked, but they're actually their own face moves when they hit somebody else's face. They're actually feeling the punch. 
This works if you're dealing with humans. We're wired to connect with each other. In zombie films, we go from this to that. And you have to ask ourselves why. And I think it's because there's no mirror neurons coming back at us. Remember how I told you zombies don't care? Zombies could care less about us. So if you've ever watched a zombie film, they're kind of stumbling towards you. You shoot them, no change in their expression. They keep walking, you shoot them. They keep walking, you shoot them. There's no anger. There's no rage. You're filled with rage because they want to end your life. So what, th what happens in every zombie film? It's not the zombies that are the problem, right? And this is the lesson I try to give the med students most of all. It, it, the zombies aren't an issue. If you made a movie only with zombies, it would be like a movie about snails. It would be really boring. They would just run around and bump into each other. That's it. <laughs> the problem are the people. The people who, for whatever reason, seem to cling even more to their petty grievances, to their petty racism, all of the, it gets me into this kind of you know, self-righteous mode because every zombie film is about how folks can't get along. The zombie problem is relatively easy to solve. This is a point that Romero made very strongly to me. That's not what these movies are about. These movies, zombies are the thing that happens. What these movies are about is how people treat each other and why people feel the permission to treat each other in ways that if it were pointed out, they would never in a million years do. This is where we could ask some tough questions. So uh, my third year residency, in, or second year residency, first week actually, because I did a year of internal medicine then started psychiatry, we had a young man who was brought in who had removed his arm with a buzzsaw. Um, he had wandered around in the woods with the arm for a while uh, until he lost so much blood that he felt dizzy, called 911, which is the emergency number, was taken by helicopter to Mass General, landed, and when I was called, as I was a psychiatrist on call, I said, why did you do this? And he said, I just need to be smaller. And it, uh, that was his answer. I just need to be smaller. I don't want to die. Please stop the bleeding, but do not sew the arm back on, although he had held onto the arm. And I didn't know what to do, and we sort of kicked this up to the ethics group. At the time, the head of my department was a Jesuit priest, so there was this very interesting conversation about what's the proper thing to do here. Remember, this is a one-hour surgery to stop the bleeding versus a 9, 10, 14-hour surgery to do the replantation. We finally did sew it back on based on Massachusetts law, which has substituted judgment, which says that you do what the patient would want if they were in their right state of mind. And as, after talking to his folks, they said, no, he needs that arm. Uh, it, it was actually, uh, to disguise the story a little bit, but that arm played a very large role in this person's life, um, even larger than it would in, would in a, lot of our, a lot of our lives. So they sewed it back on. We advised that they uh, give him... Um, antipsychotics and maybe even have them restraints when he, because he's not going to be happy about this. The surgeons, though, it, meaning well, thought, you know what? We've, we've made him better. This will fix everything. The arm's back on. That's why he was distressed. Everything should be fine. So they didn't do anything. And the next day, he started to undo the stitching to take the arm back off. And the surgeons were furious. Rather than feeling bad for him, they were filled with rage because at that point, he was the other by definition, he was the other. So they, one of my friends who I'd gone to medical school with and was training in surgery said, what we're going to do is we're going to give him succinylcholine when he comes out of the operating room and we'll paralyze him. And that way we'll teach him that we're in charge. I said, what? That's like, you can't do that. That's torture. That's literally torture. And he said, oh my God, that's right. But I felt kind of bad and he felt kind of bad at that discussion. As I'm glad he didn't do it. So I thought maybe to head this off at the pass, we could do this instead. We would never want to shoot, why would you shoot a zombie in the head rather than help him? What is it that allows us to make the other into the other? How do we get there? And I found zombies to be a useful construct for that. Finally, in the end here, connection and inspiration. That's uh, George Romero, uh, that's my daughter Sophie, that's George's wife Suzanne, and that's me before my primary care doctor told me I needed to lose some weight, hence the gut over the belt. That's at the Stratford, Ontario Shakespeare Festival. Uh, George became a dear and important mentor to me. Um, he uh, actually helped me to understand that connection is all about storytelling. Um, I, I miss him dearly. There's now a center for the study of horror in his name at the University of Pittsburgh where his letters and mine are archived, which is kind of cool. Conferences I went to took a different turn. This is my last slide, I promise. In addition to going to medical conferences, this is me at an Oxford-style debate where I was resolving that the slow-moving zombies are scarier and somebody else argued that they were faster. The guy I argued against was that heavyset guy who <laughs> went by the name um, of the Grim Reaper. That's what he called himself. Um, or, if I'm lucky, I also get invited to places like this. 
Um, so thank you very much. I'll talk to you soon. Bye-bye. <laughs>